Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. So far what we have in the book of Jonah, God said go. And Jonah said no. Go where? Go to the great city of Nineveh, the place that had the Assyrians in it, the place that they were bloodthirsty. They would capture their enemies. They would cut their heads off. They would stack them up in a pyramid. They would fillet their flesh off of them. These were people that were barbaric. And God said, Jonah, go and preach the gospel of grace to the people of Nineveh and let them know that they can be forgiven. And Jonah didn't want to do it, and Jonah ran in the opposite direction. And running in the opposite direction, Jonah gets on a boat. And on that boat, there came a great storm. And on that storm, he went down into the bottom of the boat and went to sleep. And while he was asleep, the sailors started throwing out their cargo, if you remember in the last chapter. And finally they went and they woke Jonah up and said, We don't know where you're from. We don't even know who your God is. And Jonah told them, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the God of the heavens and the earth who created them. And they were terrified because they realized that Jonah was running from God. They said, What could we or should we do? And Jonah says, Throw me overboard and the storm will get calm. And what happens? They do that. They throw him overboard. And in throwing him overboard, God had prepared ahead of time this huge fish that swallowed him. And if you remember the text, it says that while Jonah was in that fish for three days and three nights, what did Jonah do? He didn't moan and complain. It said that he prayed and he quoted the scriptures and that God delivered him and that the fish vomit Jonah out on dry land. And that's where we come to today. So if you missed any of the previous messages, that was kind of like when you used to watch television. They'd show you what happened last week and a recap. That was the recap. And so let's look together at the Old Testament book of Jonah, chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now Jonah could have avoided all of that tragedy. Jonah could have avoided all of that fish smell. Jonah could have avoided all of those things if he simply had done what? Been obedient the first time. But when I read this and it says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah, when? A second time. It makes me want to say thank you, Lord, because the Lord has given this man right here more than a second chance. And I guarantee you that if you look back in your lifetime, God has given you, given your spouse, given your children, He's given your marriage, He's given your finances, He's given everything that comes into contact with you a second chance. And so when we mess up, it's good that we've got a God that still loves us. You see, when we're God's children, whenever we sin and we're disobedient, that does not erase our birth certificate in the kingdom. You see, it just means that we are a disobedient, backsliding child of God and that needs to be corrected. Jonah was corrected by God the Father. And then in that correction, what God did was God set Jonah back on the right path and Jonah was able now to listen to God's voice a second time. God is speaking to us a second time. Maybe what we're going through now with all of these trials of this virus that's been going on, with the economy falling apart, with everything being shut down, it's caused us to spend more time not only with our family, it's caused us not only to spend more time at home, but it's caused us to spend more time hopefully with God. And in doing so, God is speaking to us a second time. And God's mission is, God's purpose and plan did not change. He still wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh. You see what God originally put in your heart, maybe when you were 20 years old, you might say, I was disobedient and I didn't answer the call of God when I was young. God's call does not change. If you've got breath in your body and you know God's called you to do something, I don't care if it's to sing a song for Him, if it's to get up and give a testimony for him, if it's to get up and teach a Sunday school class or even try to preach a sermon, if God's put it on you, my friends, you need to understand that calling has not ceased. The calling does not die. The calling is alive and active, and I thank God for that because there's been a lot of you today that have run from the call of God, but you're here today. Why? Because you know God has given you a second chance.
chance. And Jonah gets this second chance. And in his second chance, what does he do? He is obedient. And it says, so Jonah got up and went. Where did he go? He went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. You can just lay it right there, brother. I'm, I don't need these notes. I've got the Lord right now telling me what I need to be saying, okay? That's why when I saw it blow off, I was like, let it blow, let it blow, let it go. That's all right. But here it says that Jonah did what? It says that Jonah listened and did what? He went as the Lord had commanded him. And then the next part it says that now Nineveh was an extremely large city. It was a three-day walk. Maybe God allowed him to stay in that fish for three days, I thought. Not only because it's a symbol of Christ being in the tomb for three days and then coming out. But maybe those three days is that every day that Jonah walked through that city, it was a day that he remembered that he was inside that fish. And so when he preached, that you've got to repent or you will be destroyed. He also thought about how his life could have been destroyed. And then it continues. Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed, In 40 days Nineveh will be demolished. The men of Nineveh believed God. Notice they don't believe Jonah. The spokesperson, the preacher can be flawed. The Sunday school teacher can be flawed. The choir director can be flawed. But the message of Jesus is not flawed. That's why I, yeah, I get upset when I hear of all of these scandals that preachers get into, don't you? You watch TV and it seems like, oh, they just money scandals, sex scandals, all the other kind of scandals. And we say certain famous preachers' names. But I'll let you know this. That does not change. That even though that they were scandalous, it doesn't change the sanctification of the gospel that was preached people that were saved. God can use a donkey to tell a good message. And if he can use a raven to feed one of his prophets, he can use even a sinful man or a woman to preach what is gospel truth. And I thank him for that. Because we know for a fact the gospel is whole and pure and God will use whatever vessel he can. But isn't it even better to know that he cleanses us up so that when he does use us, that it brings him glory. And it says that they did not just believe what Jonah said, but they believed it because of God. They proclaimed a fast. What is a fast? Some of us don't talk about fast anymore. You might look at me and say, Pastor, do you even know what a fast is? Well, I'll tell you, the only fast I know is how fast can I get to the dining table, right? Some of you understand that kind of fast. But what I'm saying to you, this kind of fast was a biblical fast, is that we're not going to eat. And the amount of time that we would normally be spending eating, we're going to spend that time in prayer to God. It would be okay if God puts on your heart that if He says, it's time for you to fast. It's okay. I've, every time I've ever fasted, I will promise you this, is I never got up hungry. Now, fasting is not a diet plan. So don't say, well, I'm going to fast and I'll lose weight. No. It's just like your prayers. Whenever the Bible in the New Testament says when you fast and pray, to do it in private. Don't tell people what you're doing. Wash your face and then come out strengthening God's Word. You see, you don't have to brag and say, well, I fasted all day today. Well, when you did that, you got glory, not God. You see, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to pray, seek Him out. And when He puts on us to fast, then what we see is a great move. In the New Testament, we find that the disciples saw that there was a demon they could not cast out. And they asked Jesus, why couldn't we cast this demon out? He said, the only way that you could have cast this demon out is with one thing, with prayer and fasting. So obviously the disciples weren't fasting like they should. But see, when we fast, it draws us closer to God. It draws us, why? Because He feeds us with His spiritual power. It says, the men of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. And they dressed in sackcloth. Sackcloth was an itchy substance. It was hot. It was something you didn't want to be in. But it reminded them that they needed to repent, that they needed God's attention on their life. It wasn't something like what we wear today. And it says, from the greatest to the least. So what is repentance all about? It's not just for the people that are in Africa. You know, we think about missions. And yes, I've been on missions Probably over a dozen mission trips. 
But the thing is today is that missions is not about getting on a plane or a boat and going overseas. Because what good is that if we're not willing to even go across the street? You see, missions, I believe, starts at home. Because when you read Acts, the book of Acts, it says their mission started right where they were at. And then they went out further and further and preached the gospel. Some of us want to reverse that and say, God, I'll do missions as long as I can go to this place, Timbuktu. But Lord, I don't want to go to Ten City. Some of you that have never been to Duplin County, you know Ten City, right? You see, God, I want to go and do so that when I give a testimony, oh, I can talk about how I went to Africa, but I don't want to talk about how I went to Ultraville. You see, God can use you regardless of where you go. And here what we see is that God is using this man named Jonah. We must be also obedient to his call. It says that they sit there in ashes. In verse 7, And then there was a decree issued in Nineveh. By who? It is the king that is going to issue a decree. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne. He took off his royal robe. He put on sackcloth himself. He sat in ashes. And he issued this decree. Now one thing that I thought of this week while praying and studying this scripture is verse number 6. If you are marking your Bible, this is one of those mark me verses in my opinion. When the word reached the king. Stop there for just a moment. When what reached the king? The word reached the king. Not Jonah. Not some kind of big parade. Not some type of evangelistic track that was flashy. Not a commercial on YouTube or anything like that. But what? When the word reached the king. If you want to see a change in your job with your boss, pray that the word will reach your boss. You want to see a change in your children? Pray that the word will reach your children. You want to see a change in any situation that you're dealing with? What do you do? Oh, dear God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, let the word reach them wherever they are. You know, the word, even though we might not be able to go on a mission trip to North Korea, I want to tell you today is that the word of God still can penetrate that nation. Even though we might not be able to go into certain areas of the world. And some of us are afraid to go in certain areas, even in Pender County. But I will let you know this. The word of God can go into any area. And the word of God is powerful enough. It will change not only a king, but it will change any man or woman that their heart is prepared by God. It says that by order of the king, his nobles, no man, no beast, no herd or flock is to taste anything at all, meaning that the whole kingdom is going to have a fast. Maybe we as a nation should call for not only our prayers, but maybe as a nation we say, Lord, we have turned so far from you that we need a fast. And so it says that the king declared this. It says they must not eat nor drink. And in verse 8, furthermore, both man and beast must be covered in sackcloth. And everyone must call out earnestly to God. What is an earnest call to God? I'm glad you asked. Y'all are asking some mighty good questions today. What an earnest call to God is, is not one of these quick, fast food lunch prayers. Now, what do I mean by fast food lunch? Did you know that when you go to a fast food restaurant, that when you go through the drive-thru, if your order's not ready, that nine times out of ten, what they will tell you to do is to pull up, even if no one's behind you. Now, I thought that's about some of the most foolish stuff. I, if nobody's behind me, why do I need to pull up? And so I asked one of the ladies one time, why do I need to pull up if no one's behind me? She said, sir, as long as your car is sitting right here, that we are counting that order and that we are losing time and that we've got to get you past this window. I said, even if my order's not ready, 
She said, well, the whole point is to get your money and to move you up. And then we are clocked on our speed and efficiency. And so they're not worried about the quality. They're worried about the speed of it. Sometimes I think our prayer lives are like that fast food line. Lord, we just want to hurry up and get it done just to say we pray. Lord, I'm going to say I pray over a meal, and I'm going to just say, Lord, bless my food, and then we start stuffing it in our mouth. I can remember when my little boy, who's now 20 years old, whenever we were praying one day, and we were at lunchtime and sitting at the table, he, we were eating. Before we eat, we said a prayer. I was starting to pray. Dear Lord, we're thankful for this food. Well, about that time, I heard something smackety, smackety, smack. I looked over there, and Nathaniel, I don't know, he might have been four or five years old, he had already started reaching in, eating the food. He was that eager to get hold of it. My friends, when you pray enough, when you do finally get hold of your food, how many of you know it's going to be a whole lot better? You see, there's at times, I just found out, in Burger King in Wallace, that one of the employees there has just contracted COVID-19. I saw that last night, and my wife and I were talking about that we go out to eat and we're in such a hurry to eat, we better make sure that we're praying over this food, folks. Have we not? We better make sure we're praying over. And then you see about the different factories and all that, the workers are getting COVID-19 in the meat factories. I want to let you know that God Almighty, when you seek Him in prayer, that God Almighty can bless you and God Almighty can heal you and God Almighty can move upon you and God Almighty can sanctify that food. Now, I, I might not say that God will take the calories out. Because every time I've got a box of Krispy Kremes and prayed over it, I still gain a little bit of weight. But the point is this. Spend more time in prayer and you'll see more results in your prayers. Amen. Now, there are times that our prayers are short. I've had people pull out front of me and I've hollered out, Oh, Lord, help me. Because they pulled out front of me. Haven't you? Got to hear those prayers. But God doesn't want all our prayers just to be, well, hello there, people driving by waving at us, and I'm trying to wave back. I tell you, that's a southern thing, you know, when somebody waves, you got to wave, and then I drop my microphone. But <laughs> it's all right to smile, even if you're on outside church. Amen. But the thing is, is that our prayers have to be saturated in God's Word. Now, I'm thankful for this wind, but this wind definitely has gotten hold of the Scriptures today. I'm glad I've read my sermon ahead of time. <laughs> It says that furthermore, both man and beast were to wear the salt cloth and ashes, seek out God earnestly, meaning be serious about it. And then the next part it says, each must turn from his evil ways. It's repentance, folks. Repentance in the book of Jonah. Turn from your evil ways. You cannot go to the altar and say, Lord, I earnestly seek you. I want you to save me, redeem me. Then get up and go back home and beat your wife. That's not salvation in my book. You can't go and, and repent with your mouth and then go and run out on your spouse. You can't do these things. And the reason why is because that's not true salvation. The only thing that is is just words. And it's not a change of a transformation of your heart. You see, you can say all day long, you stand in your garage and you've heard the old saying, I'm a car, I'm a car. But when you walk out of your garage, you're not a car. You see, just saying it doesn't make it true. And so here it says that it's earnestly told them to do what? Turn from your evil ways. And from what? The violence that you do. Now, when we originally read the book of Jonah as children, we had no clue that the Ninevites were as violent. When the Bible says, turn from your violence, we had no clue that they were as violent as what they truly are until we study history. And then it says this. It says, turn from the violence that he's doing. Verse 9. Oh, you're going to love this. It says, who knows? In verse 9. Who knows? Oh, that's just a sentence there. Who knows? Who knows what? what's about to happen. If we repent, we put on the sackcloth, we fast, we are earnest about it, we turn from our evil ways, we stop practicing the violence that we were practicing, then the king says this, who knows? I'll tell you who knows what's about to happen, God. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we may not 
not perish, that we will not perish. Now, I had someone say to me recently, he said, you know, it's good that the God of the Old Testament is not like the God of the New Testament. And I thought to myself, what do you mean by that? And what they were saying to me is that isn't it good that the God of the Old Testament was like the God of anger and wrath? But the God of the good New Testament is a God of love and mercy. If that's how you read your Bible, my friends, you're not reading it right. God does not change. God's anger still burns against the sins of the Sodomites. God's anger still burns against the sins of the abortionists. God's anger still burns against the sins of the gossiper, the liar, the backstabber. God's anger still burns. The only difference is, is God sent Jesus Christ to pay the price so that we could be born again and forgiven. In the Old Testament, it says they were saved by faith. In the New Testament, we're saved by faith and grace of God. Here it continues. It says, who knows God may turn and relent. He may turn from His burning anger so that we will not perish. Verse 10, the last verse, it says the following. Then God, saw their actions. You know, God sees us right here, right now. He does, and I'm thankful for that. God sees you and your obedience to be here today. God sees your love for the message, your love for the scriptures, your love for the gospel songs that were sung. God sees that. But God also sees what you did Saturday night. He doesn't just see when we do good, when we're good little boys and girls. But God sees when we're disobedient little spiritual brats. Doesn't he see that? Yes. But God still loves us when we're his children, when we're lovable and when we're not. I thank God for that because there's been a lot of times in my own life I've probably not been so lovable. How about you? It says, Then God saw their actions that they had turned from their evil ways. Notice it isn't just the words that God had saw and heard. He sees action. How many of you have had people say, oh, I love you? And then their actions did not match the words. They smile in your face. They stab you in the back. And you wonder, what's wrong with these people? Well, my friends, we know for a fact that not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God. But it's those who truly have said, Lord, Lord, and turn from their evil ways. It is more than our words. It is our actions as well. It says that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster that he had threatened to do to them. And he did not do it. Now I want to close up with this. Three quick points that we see today. One is that if you feel like that God spoke to you years ago, or maybe God has spoken to your heart just even recently, and you're like, God, no, I don't want to do that. I'm not qualified to do that, Lord. I don't have enough courage to do that. I want to let you know that God is still giving you an opportunity as long as there's breath in your body to do His work, to do His will. Don't underestimate the power of God's second chances. Number two, what do we discover in this scripture today? Is that God's message can go out to anyone. To the plumber, to the president. God's message can go out to the CEO or to the janitor of a business. You see, the message is not just for those who live in the country club. It's even for those like us who just live in the country. Amen? Amen. You see, God's message is for all people if we will be obedient to his call. Third and final, what do we learn this morning? We learn this, is that when we repent and when we turn from our wicked ways, what will God do? God will pull back His hand of wrath and disaster on us. I believe if you search out America's history, America has gone through some things in this world that we probably wondered, God, where were you? And what God has looked down upon us and said through His Word, it's not where I was, God is saying, but where were you? Where were you? America used to be called a Christian nation. 
the people of God. We were founded on liberties. And we had religious freedom. And now what do we have now? There was a church in Wake County. How many of you know Wake County? Wake County up in Raleigh area. Raleigh, Cary, all of that area. There was a church that was up in Wake County. The preacher and the church, they opened up. They limited last week only 10 people could go inside the church to worship. Because they did that, that church had received hundreds, and some of the th reports I read, almost thousands of calls, emails, letters, and death threats, hate mail, all because that church opened its door and allowed 10 people to come in. It said, oh, you're being... Uh, you're being not responsible by opening up the doors letting 10 people in. My thing is when I read that, how sad it is we live in a nation where in the Bible belt of this nation, if a church opens its doors, you get thousands of people all riled up and mad because of something like that. They won't in there preaching a false gospel. They won't in there marrying one man to another man. They weren't in there doing anything that was unbiblical. They just opened the doors and said, we're going to follow the governor's legal decree, only let 10 people in. And when they did that, it said they let the wrath of the community came down upon them. I'll say this to you, my friends. I guarantee you all the hundreds of people that called that preacher and wrote that church and emailed those nasty emails how many of them were emailing Lowe's and Home Depot and Walmart and all these other places that opened up? How many of them were all worried about what was going to happen in there? I guarantee you none of them were. And the reason why is because there's a difference of what happens in God's house and what happens down at Home Depot and what happens down at Walmart. You see, because what happens here is that our hearts and minds get centered on Him. But wouldn't it be something if God's people said, you know what, the next time we go in Home Depot, if the Spirit of God hits me and I just want to praise Him, I'll praise Him. Well, who knows, Home Depot might be getting some hate emails and letters and all. Amen? But you see, we're afraid to do that because we live in a nation like what we live in. So today, if you're seeking to draw closer to God, the good news of the Scripture says you have a second chance to do so. The good news today is if you've never came into a relationship, I'm not asking you this morning to say a, a, a word or some kind of secret prayer, but what I'm asking you to do is what the Bible says, you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you shall be saved. If you're willing to do that and you want to do that, you can call me and let me know and I will pray with you. We'll come in agreement together. One thing that's been on my heart for the last seven weeks now, my little boy will be seven weeks old tomorrow. And one thing for seven weeks, God has just completely put on my mind and my heart for seven weeks, almost day after day. It's something I've not even shared with you yet. But what God has put on my heart is that whenever I have to see that baby lay there, that baby cannot clothe himself. That baby cannot change his diaper. Before I came here, I changed that baby's diaper his mama, she was trying to get us formula and different things ready. I changed them, getting them ready. We work together. Husbands and wives should work together when it comes to any of that. And so I'm doing this. And then I realize that baby can't get up and tell me what he needs to tell me. He doesn't know anything like that. He was crying, and my daughter Zoe said, uh, why does he cry like he is crying? I said, well, that's the way he talks to us, letting us know what's wrong. He doesn't, hasn't learned the language. He hasn't learned how to talk Southern yet. Trust me, he will. And what's come to my heart, and I want to get to the point, is that just like I have to completely teach this child, love this child, guide this child, because I am part of the reason why that child's here. How many of us know that we have failed so often that when we lead people to the Lord that they are babes in Christ? 
We have led them to the Lord and we have left them there in their spiritual diapers. We've left them there in their spiritual onesies. We've left them there in their spiritual pacifiers and they have no clue what to do. And then we get mad because we say, well, why are they acting like they're acting? Because they're a baby. We've not discipled them. We have not helped them grow in Christ. And it does not happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. Whenever I started pastoring, I was 20 years old. I'm up, in a few months, I'll be 45. But I will tell you this, the way I've grown from 20 to now, it is I thank God for that. But I didn't do it by myself. It took godly people that come by my side teaching me and helping me. And that's where you and I come into the play. If there's someone we lead to the Lord, let's just don't see them be birthed and leave to the wayside. Let's see them be birthed and grow in Christ. And you might not ever see the fruits of your labor. But I will tell you this, God sees it. Amen. Amen. So I guess my challenge to you is this, is that not only lead someone to the Lord, but help disciple them while they're in the Lord. See them grow. Let's have a time of prayer.